that uh, spring, I didn't want to go back to being a waiter because I was a terrible waiter and bound to starve. And an actor, <laughs> really young actor especially, has to get another profession he's good at. I had the gift of gab, so I, uh, I easily could have been a bartender or something like that, but I was afraid I couldn't remember the 30, 35 drinks you know, while I could memorize a, the 90 lines of a script, no problem. Don't ask me why. That was the voice of author, playwright, and retired Broadway theater manager, Dan Landon. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to have him on as the guest of this episode of the Page and Stage podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jason Cannon. Before diving into my conversation with Dan, a brief Page and Stage plug. This podcast is only one part of my story coaching work. Go check out pageandstage.art. That's pageandstage.art. And there you'll find not just every previous episode of this podcast, but also the archive of my weekly newsletter, which is full of tips, tricks, inspiration, and encouragement for storytellers of all stripes. You can sign up for free and get the newsletter directly into your inbox each Friday, as well as every new podcast right into your inbox every other Monday. Everything is free, but if you find value in all my storytelling content, you can financially support me at pageandstage.art or forward any of the newsletters or podcasts to other story-loving friends or hire me outright as your personal story coach. So if you're working on a memoir, play, or speech, I cannot wait to hear your story. Now, let me tell you a bit more about my awesome guest, Dan Landon. Dan began his career in New York as an actor, appearing on Broadway for one opening night, as well as off-Broadway. He then turned to theater management, first at the American Place Theater, and then second with the Broadway producer Alex Cohen, and then for three decades with the Schubert Organization. Dan is also a produced playwright and published novelist. His plays have appeared off-Broadway and regionally. He lived for many years in Montclair, New Jersey, with his wife Lyle and their three children. After his retirement, they moved to Bradenton, Florida, where both he and Lyle are active in the theater scene on the Gulf Coast. And Dan's memoir, from the Back of the House, Memoir of a Broadway Theater Manager, was published earlier this year by Ibis Books. If his stories and connections to Broadway and film stars are any indication, Dan can probably outdo Kevin Bacon in terms of degrees of separation. Here we go with my conversation with Dan Landon. I am online here with the one and only Dan Landon. This is super exciting because not only is Dan bursting to the brim with amazing Broadway stories, but I just published his book earlier this year, From the Back of the House, Memoir of a Broadway Theater Manager. And uh, he's been having some great success with it, had some events in New York, and just it was so much fun to put this book together with you, Dan, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jason. So yeah, we're going to talk about the book plenty, but there's so much to explore with you because you're also, not just are you a memoirist, but you're an author, you're a playwright, and your claim to fame, you appeared on Broadway for one night. Am I remembering that story that correctly? Is correct. <laughs> the name of the play was Morning Pictures, not M-O-R-N, but M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And it was Anna Moore's play about her mother's illness with cancer. And we had a week of previews, and then it opened, and Sam Schwartz, the producer, this distinguished gentleman who produced many Broadway shows, he wore leather gloves and a cane. He was like right out of central casting. <laughs> he got us all together and said, I'm sorry. The reviews are so bad, I just feel I must close the show immediately. No, we're not going to do a performance tonight. We're just going to close the show. 
And <laughs> Leora Dana, who'd won the Tony before, the year before, Best Supporting Actress Tony for The Last of Mrs. Lincoln, I believe, with Julie Harris, said, well, Kay Carney, the director, a professor at New Paltz, said, I was taking too long to die on stage. <laughs> well, Leora went, now I really have. So that's <laughs> that. So that's that. Catherine that, Walker was in that production, too. She eventually did two very interesting things. She played the lead in Slap's Shot. The owner of the hockey team was Paul Newman, and she married James Taylor. And I believe that was one of her few Broadway shows, but uh, Catherine was a lovely lady. Anyhow, and uh, <laughs> anyhow. We closed after one night, and uh, I was filled with such hope. I would find out later, knowing who they were finally, that I had beaten Richard Gere and Tommy Holtz out of that part. <laughs> we were all gathered at the Barrymore Theater, of all places, sitting in a room, and we were called on stage to do our audition. And uh, we all did. And uh, later that night, I got a call from Kay Carney. And my hair was long. I was out of the service by about three months and had started it, growing it back. And uh, she said, well, you, you were natural. The other two were too actorish for me. You were <laughs> natural in the role. So I chose you. And I said, thank you, Kay. And I was fighting with my father at the time. It's a long story. But I was fighting with my father at the time, living with him, with my younger brother, Chris, in Queens, New York, Jamaica. And as Queen, when I got that part in the Broadway show, my brother, Chris, said, you went from a bum to a star. <laughs> made him, oh, we should have called your book that from a bump to a star. <laughs> right, made him the proudest man in Jamaica because I'd gotten the show. And oh uh, that might be the life. title of this podcast episode from a bum to a star. <laughs> That's so good. And yeah, so, yeah I closed like, in one night and I went I back know. to being a bum. <laughs> Yeah, so that, in a weird way, this was kind of a gift, though, because you then pivoted your theater career, and that people, you should read the book, because he covers this in a lot more detail, but Dan, how soon after your one-night Broadway debut did you pivot into being a theater manager? And two-part question, as you talk about becoming a theater manager, for the listeners who maybe aren't familiar, what is a theater manager? What, what did your job as a theater manager in tail? Well, off-Broadway, the answer was not much. I had <laughs> to get the audience in their seats, make sure no one fell down, make sure the temperature was right in the theater. A lot of things I did on Broadway, not as extensive, because I did the puck payroll for everyone on Broadway. But I was actually an actor a couple more years trying at it. And I actually got this job through my girlfriend who was stage manager on Yanks 3 Detroit Zero, a play about a Yankee pitcher who uh, feels that uh, if he doesn't win this game, he's going to lose his house, his wife, his mistress. Oh, yes, it gets interesting. Jonathan Reynolds wrote it, and I played a New York Yankee who walked on stage and threw rubber baseballs at Tony at the one part during the show when he imagines that the relief pictures are throwing baseballs at him. And I did that, and then I went outside to the lobby at the end of the show and sold subscriptions to the theater, and I sold a thousand of them. I got a dollar a subscription in my Yankee uniform. Wow. And uh, that uh, spring, I didn't want to go back to being a waiter because I was a terrible waiter and bound to starve. And <laughs> an actor, really, a young actor especially, has to get another profession he's good at. I had the gift of gab, so 
I, uh, I easily could have been a bartender or something like that, but I was afraid I couldn't remember the 30, 35 drinks you know, while I could memorize a, the 90 lines of a script, no problem. Don't ask me why. At any rate, I was a terrible waiter. I did do that, and I didn't want to go back to it. So I asked Julia Miles, who was the general manager of the theater, if I could have the job as the theater manager. The theater manager just left. And she said, yes, I thought you were an actor, but okay. I said, well, if I get something, I'll tell you, and maybe we can work out a leave, or I'll just uh, give up the job. At any rate, she gave me the job, and that's how I became a theater manager. But I tried to get jobs as an actor for another, oh, two, almost three years, and I would still go to auditions, and my book actually ends with me going to this one audition where a very famous actress who'd been very famous in the 40s was there. And that's how my book ends, actually, the story yeah. of me auditioning for that part and her and who she was and just how hard it is to yeah. be an actor. Yeah. And is that part of the reason that you stuck then with the theater manager job? Did you fall in love with being a theater manager or was it more just getting tired of the actor grind or a combination? Well, the actor grind was part of the reason, and I did fall in love, but it was with a woman. Oh, <laughs> a twist. <laughs> and we soon had children, and I had moved on to Alex Cohen's office, where I worked on Richard, Richard Rogers' last musical, I Remember Mama, with the great Norwegian film star, Lee Volman singing the role of mama and i need say nothing more leave was a great actress when it came to singing ah not so much at any rate and she kept demanding every new song mr rogers would write that she be the individual who sings the new song instead of george hearn which had an who had an incredible voice eventually to play the lead in Lacajo Fall and Sweeney Todd, other songs, beautiful voice at any rate. It was a musical with Lee Volman, played the Schubert in Philadelphia in uh, New York. We got the Majestic Theater. I was gone by then. I had been hired away. But we got the Majestic Theater, and it ran 100 performances and then closed. I was once in a limousine with Alec Cohen, Alex Cohen, and we were riding up to get Rudolf Nureyev to sign a contract. Alec also had a film company, and he would do these little side shows, along with the Tonys. The name of the company was Brentwood Television. At any rate, I was a gopher for Alex at that point, and he took me up to Nureyev's house was delightful. Nuriyev's family was there, and, you know, he signed, the great dancer signed his contract, and I had to take it back. But on the way up there, Alec went to me, you know, I don't like doing this commercial stuff, meaning I remember Mama, believe me, he wishes it had been commercial. At any rate, at any rate, I, ever the nice yes man, go, yes, Mr. Cohen, you did Richard Burton in Hamlet and all, and all of the Harold Pinter plays. You go to London, you see them, and you bring them to New York and, and present them, all those wonderful plays, the homecoming, this, that, the other. Alec gets silent for a moment and then says, yes. But really, really, Dan, Pinter is full of crap. At any rate, working for the Cohen office was great. I made friends I still have to this day. I got to say, yeah, because one of your superpowers, Dan, and this might be one of the reasons why being a theater manager was such a good fit for you, is that you, ha you have the ability to remember names and details and companies. And, I mean, and people who read the book, you'll see this. Dan knows everybody. <laughs> and if you've crossed his path once, 
He's got a project for you. He's going to remember your name. He's going to remember your kid's birthday. That's just the way he's wired. But talk to me a little bit about this, Dan, because you love the theater. You're trying to be an actor, be a storyteller on the stage. You become a theater manager. I would love for you to talk a little bit about how being a theater manager still scratched your artistic itch, how being a theater manager is not just ancillary to the entire Broadway storytelling experience, but in fact, part and parcel, necessary. How, how does Dan, the theater manager, directly impact the story on stage and the experience of the people in the audience? Well, in any theater, you know this, Jason, having worked in many theaters for many years, that everyone, in a way, is a part of the production. Yeah. I mean, the theater manager, if someone gets sick in the audience and you have to stop the show, the actors want to know why. What happened? That's the first question you get answered. You know, there is an integration between the theater and the performers, a great integration down to the detail that when the show closes and after you take the scenery out and you lock up the theater uh, several weeks after the show closes, you're out of work until the theater is booked again. So now I worked on many shows where I worked great lengths of time on the same show, like 42nd Street, David Merrick's 42nd Street. I worked on Cats for a while. I worked on Phantom for a year, filling in for other managers who were, who had gotten sick or couldn't do the job. So it's integral. What we all do in the theater is integral to the whole production, starting uh, with the people who sell the tickets to people who take the tickets in, the ushers who take people to their seats. It's all integral. Now, of course, the stars of the show are what we pay attention and why we buy the ticket. But a theater is made up of many people who work hard. And on Broadway, these people work hard for years, often doing the same thing, whether it's ushering or as a stage hand or as a musician. These people work for years, and we become good friends over time, or at least we know each other. And uh, if we patch each other on the street, usually you stop for a second and say, hello, what are you doing now? What show are you doing? Because if they're in the Times Square area, the five blocks that comprise Broadway from mostly 8th Avenue to 7th Avenue, you're working on a show and you want to know about that show and how it's going and how the star is. Believe me, that's a question, how the star is, because stars are all over the spectrum. Most of them are wonderful. Most of them are wonderful and happy to be doing a Broadway show. And most of them treat the other performers they work with with respect. But there are others, I won't name many names, but there are others <laughs> who, who just are not in the mood or who sign the contract and don't really want to do it or, or are suffering from other problems. May you rest in peace, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman had issues, and his issues were early in his life, drug addiction, fighting the addiction most of his adult life, and winning, not doing it. But toward the end, when I worked with him, he had started drinking again and had become very sealed off from the rest of, of the cast and crew of Death of a Salesman, which he was brilliant in. I remember two guys, young men, who were making a 20-minute film, and they came up to Bill Camp, who played his friend in Death of a Salesman, and said, boy, if you could only get us to talk to Phil, Philip Seymour Hoffman for five minutes, we have a great five-line part that he we think he would be wonderful in, in our little movie. And Bill Camp went to them, I don't know how I do that. 
he only talks to me on stage when we're acting. And I totally understand that. Phil used to run out of the theater at the end of the show. Yeah. I had Annette Benning standing next to me and asked the stage manager, you know, she would like to, to meet Phil. And they said, well, he's left already. I stood there flabbergasted. It was literally a minute after the curtain call. A week later, her husband, Warren Beatty, comes by and says, I would like to meet Phil. Well, I tried to be smart about this. And I'd seen him, Phil, walking out of the theater with his coat pulled up high around his neck, walking out in the far west alley with the audience. Ah, smart. With the audience after playing the salesman in, in Death of a Salesman. So I said to Warren, well, let's try this. So we go out that alley, and my stage hand of Victor, big guy, actually, actually a former boxer, was there at the stage door, and he points to, like, behind the stage door. So Warren and I go down, Victor opens the door, and there is Phil pulling up his pants, being <laughs> dressed to leave the theater so he doesn't have to talk or see anyone. Doesn't even want to go into a dressing room. Yeah. He sees Warren Beatty and he says, Warren, not many people catch me here. (laughs) Meaning he would preset his clothes on that side so he could just dress and leave the theater. And the next day I got in trouble. The company manager calls me and tells me, oh, Phil was very upset. She doesn't want, he he doesn't want anyone uh, uh, coming in that way to the theater to see him. Everybody's got to go through the stage door. Yeah, well, I can only imagine. I mean, Willie Loman, the uh, energetic yeah. and emotional cost. I can totally get not oh, wanting yeah. to be social after doing that show. I totally yeah, get that. Exactly, exactly. At any rate, two days later, Betty comes by with an older woman, I believe probably an investor or someone he was talking to in investing in his next movie. And I am under a chair looking for a lady's earring. And Beatty is walking out the West Alley again to go find Philip. And my uh, ticket taker yells at him, oh, no, Mr. Beatty, everyone has to go through the stage door. We've been told everyone has to go through the stage door. And he yells back, oh, no, I know where he is. (laughs) (laughs) He goes so, back that way, and I never heard about it. Phil must have left already, or what have yep. you. And Warren must have wandered him around backstage alone, not finding. And he him. he wanders to this day. <laughs> wanders to this day. It Lost sounds, in Dan, the Barry like, Theater. Again. Yeah, it sounds like being a theater manager runs the gamut. I mean, everything from you know, taking Warren Beatty to catch Philip with his pants down to finding lost earrings to, <laughs> to be in the, the whipping boy for everything that goes wrong. Oh, or I mean, it sounds like theater. I, you, I was much afraid of a once, catch-all. during indiscretions. I was afraid once the air conditioning went out and it was a New York day that was 96 Oish, degrees oh. humid. And so the cast does the matinee performance and they call me backstage and it's, it's brutal. It's brutal in the theater. It's brutal outside. It's absolutely brutal on stage under the, the house lights. So they're there and Roger Reese has become the spokesman for Kathleen Turner and a little unknown called Jude Law. Yeah. And Cynthia Nixon and Eileen Atkins. And they're discussing, should we do the show tonight? And the stage manager is saying, well, you know, as hot as the theater is, you are within your union rights to deny to do the show. It's very interesting. Schubert ran Monday through f- Friday like a clock, but then the weekend would come. And uh, we couldn't couldn't get contractors in to fix a problem like this. The engineers told me both compressors are out and what have you. So 
they I asked me to step outside the room. Now, the show was not doing terrifically well with Kathleen Turner and uh, the other actors I mentioned before. So they asked me to step outside because this is all, it all falls back on the theater manager. Why is the air conditioning out? Why did you notice it before the weekend or did this just happen? And, you know, we're going to lose an entire sold out performance Saturday night if they decided not to do it. Well, out in the hall, pacing like a madman, because if the show is canceled, this is all going to come back to me. Why wasn't, how did this happen? You sure you didn't see a weakness in the air conditioning before, which I might have. I don't know. I don't remember. But at any rate, they call me into the dressing room and they say, Roger Reese says, Dan, okay, we'll do the show, but please try in every way you can to make it as cool as possible. So they agreed to do the show. I had the doors to the theater open all afternoon. And finally at night, around 6.30, the weather breaks. Mm. New cold front moves down 47th Street, and I open the fans up, and it's pumping cooler air into the theater, and we make it through the show. And I was very proud of it. Very <laughs> proud of Proud of so, my look. Yeah, my, well, I was going to say, theater well, managers also now control the weather. I get it. <laughs> well, Lord knows when a jackhammer is going down on, uh, you know, rattling down the block. That's my problem. Stop that jackhammer. And I'd have to go to the construction men and negotiate. Can you wait a half hour till the show is over? Do you have to do it right now? Could you give us a break? We were neighbors with all the other people on the block. So the big building next door to us, the Morgan Stanley building, would often uh, give us a break. Stop that. But a lot of the times, that was not the case. We had a parking lot next to the theater for many years, and then they sold the parking lot, and it was built, uh, they built uh, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings there. And they had a third floor, and they started playing this game Cornhole on the third floor. So the guys and girls were up there shouting, yelling, and the cast could hear it. The stage door was just down this alleyway, and uh, the stage was right there. And I had to go there and negotiate with the manager and, and just stop the game till the show was over. And people understood that there was a Broadway theater here, and you got to just cool it for a little while till the show's over. All those people were very upset that the game was stopped because they were, you know, they had been having a few drinks doing this. Oh, of course. Of year. course. Yeah. So a theater manager, this is also what a theater manager does. You're in charge of you're the- a nego entire, You're like a negotiator. <laughs> entire environment on Broadway. You know, Broadway theater, most theater does not happen in a vacuum. It happens in a special place, whether it's the Oslo Theater here in Sarasota or Florida Studio Theater. Or the players, you know, it's all in a special place at a special time. On Broadway in particular, because people have paid so much money for the uh, the tickets. Yeah, so great time to pivot, Dan. You just mentioned the players. And I wanted to bring this up, too, is that you also, along with dropping the book, which we're going to get to, you've already been telling some great stories. You just had a world premiere production of your newest play. Like, as I mentioned, you're also an author and a playwright. Talk a little bit about why you also write. Have you always been a writer? Was this something new that happened once you retired? And how did your world premiere production go? Well, like I, I always say, show business is in my blood because uh -huh. my uncles were choir boys at the church right around the corner in Queens, New York in Jamaica. And the choir master actually worked out this deal with the little church around the corner on 26th Street in Manhattan for the, get them to come in once a month and do a choir of these 10 
choir boys singing religious hymns, of course. And George S. Kaufman, the great George S. Kaufman who wrote, you, you know, you can't take it with you. Later on, uh, The Man Who Came to Dinner, many shows with Moss Hart. Uh, he had seen the choir boys, and he said, I want the choir, but especially I want the two twin boys, and those were my uncles, Dan and Don, to be in the show. As great thing because they had lived through the terrible poverty of the de Depression. My grandfather had issues. He lost his job in a bank, and his son had died from diphtheria shortly before he said that he didn't want his son to get the immunization for diphtheria. He prohibited that. And shortly after, his oldest son, Richard, died of diphtheria. So he went into a massive depression, drinking, etc., throughout the Depression. My grandmother, Laura, worked at Ideal Toys right across the street on, on Jamaica Avenue, and she helped support the family all the way through the Depression, although she didn't make much money. At any rate, when this came along, and my uncles got to be the choir boys on Broadway and the man who came to dinner with Monty Woolley, they were making $100 a week. Now, a good job in 1939, good job, you got paid $25 a week. So here they were making 100 a week, and they pulled the family out of the terrible poverty they'd known throughout the Depression. My father was their understudy. So, so yes, show business does run in my blood. And my uncle, uh, my father, actually took off two years of working on Madison Avenue to write a play and to have the play produced. And he wrote a play and called an encore for Eddie, and he had it done off-off Broadway and was on the verge of raising the money to do it on Broadway. Keenan Wynn, a very famous actor of the time, agreed to to be in the play. And Paul Vroom, his partner, his producing partner, and he, there's no way to say this easily, he and Paul Vroom went up to this lady who was going to totally back the play to be on Broadway, and they were drunk. Mm. They read her the play, and soon, immediately after, she pulled her money and said, I, I don't think I can do this now. At any rate, that's how close he came. But he had great success as a writer of industrial shows. In 1969, he wrote The Milliken Show, which was the biggest show in New York at the time, produced for $3 million. And a Broadway show at the time, like, say, Coco, the budget was a million dollars. Oh, wow. It for the Milliken show was $3 million. And uh, the director was Michael Bennett, who eventually would direct Chorus Line and Ballroom and Dream Girls. And the composer was Marvin Hamlish, who uh, wrote the music for Chorus Line. And uh, Rene Abourgenois was the lead in it, playing the same part, flamboyant designer, that he did in Coco. And I later worked with. René Bourgeois on Sly Fox when it played the Barrymore. And I worked with his son, too, René Bourgeois, who was in Death of a Salesman. At any rate, show business was always there. It was part of our family. And so when I got out of high school, I was voted the most dramatic in high school because I did seven. Shocker. <laughs> I was voted the most dramatic in high school. I'd done The Miracle Worker and Once Upon a Mattress, I played The Mute King. And uh, that's another reason I uh, gave up show business or trying to be an actor. I, I was not a good singer. And my mm -hmm. uncle and my fathers, they were beautiful singers. And I was not a good singer. So, so... It was the old Jose Quintero, a brilliant director who directed many of uh, e Eugene O'Neill's shows. His autobiography is called 
if you don't sing, they beat you. Meaning <laughs> that singing is such an important part of an actor's life on Broadway in the Broadway of the 1950s, 60s, even 70s. And I was not a good singer. And at any rate, so that was another reason I, I drew away from acting. Although, you know, I was a decent actor. I got a, got a good review in the New York Times for <laughs> the Rhymers of Eldritch. I was cast by Lanford Wilson himself in the role. I auditioned up at Equity Library Theater, and I played that lead across from Amy Wright, who is a brilliant actress, had a good career, and eventually married Rip Torn, the very famous actor, Rip Torn. And that's very interesting because at the time, he was still married to Academy Award winner Geraldine Page, and they all lived together in a house in Connecticut. Don't ask. It's show business. Wow, wow seriously. Seriously, it's show business. And, and Rip, of course, is a story unto himself. And yeah, yeah. So, so how did you I then get into the into the acting. writing side of things? How did you get into the writing side of things? Well, again, my father was my inspiration. He wrote industrial shows at one of those industrial shows. He, uh, for Esso at the time, which became Exxon Oil, he wrote the station manager who says, hey, the tiger comes out and says, hey, Check that oil, wash those windows, and put a tiger in your tank. That was him. That was my father. Well, next year, when the executives for SO Exxon came back to McCann Erickson, they said they printed, presented them an idea, a program, and the CEO went, You know what? I don't think so. What we really like was that tiger. Put a tiger in your tank. So that's what he did. So my father uh, worked in show business, writing industrial shows, et cetera, et cetera. And writing always appealed to me as writing theater. I, I always felt was the most important part of theater. Mm, talk about that. What do, you, what do you mean by that, Dan? What, what do you mean by the writing part is the most important part of theater? Well, the play is everything. The play is everything. And the plays, plays rarely come out totally written. They're not written, they're wrought. So oh, yeah. Productions and readings and all this stuff. And you listen to people who are theater professionals and they say, you know, I think this could be a little bad or this might be a little offensive. And, and, and you change it. You try to please the audience. You think about it is what you do. Now you make the ultimate choice as the playwright, but you think about it and through productions, it changes. Hopefully it improves. You make it better. But I always was enamored of, of the writing for the theater. I mean, the second Broadway show I worked on, the third actually, was Amadeus by Oh, wow. Peter Schaffer, the brilliant Amadeus, which won an EGOT of itself in a way. It won the Tony for Best Play and soon after won Best Picture as a movie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, that was my original exposure to theater writing. And, of course, off-Broadway, too, I'd worked on many plays at the American Place Theater, many of which needed productions and development. So I, I came to really appreciate a good play when I saw it. One of my favorites is when you started in it, FST, Doubt, by John Patrick Shanley. Oh, that's a great play. A, a beautiful, great play uh, with uh, Cherry Jones in the lead on Broadway and another friend of mine, Brian O'Byrne playing the priest and uh, Cherry, because she was a good friend of Sarah Paulson, who was doing the glass menagerie in my theater with Jessica Lang. Cherry, since Doubt was only an hour and a half long and glass menagerie was two and a half hours, used to come over the theater to watch Sarah. And often 
she would just come up to my office and we'd sit in my office and shoot the breeze. But she was brilliant in that play. Yeah. <laughs> Merle Streep did the movie and Merle's a wonderful actress. But my favorite always was Cherry in that role. She just had yeah. the right amount of vitriol in her yeah. investigation of the priests and her feeling that she's absolutely right going after someone who is drinking wine with a choir boy behind the altar. That was not appropriate. And Cherry went after him as hard as she could in that play. And it's a brilliant oh, play. Yeah. You did I got it. to see her I got to you see her do it in St. Louis. Yeah. At at FST. How long ago was that, Jason? Oh, it wasn't a I directed Doubt and played Father Flynn. That was back in St. Louis though. It wasn't at Florida Studio Theater. Oh, and wasn't I saw that? Cherry in that in the touring when it, when the Broadway show basically toured the country. She was at the Fox, the fabulous Fox in St. Louis, and I got to see her in it there and it was she was spectacular. She is great. Yeah. Great great stage actress. Kate. I like her in movies too. I like her in anything she does. Magic Merle did the movie uh, with Philip Seymour Hoffman of all. That's right. Back to Phil, yep. And so, uh, Dan, we we're talking about writing. I want to pivot now into your book itself from the back of the house, your memoir. And so everyone listening, like you're getting a kind of a little sneak peek. Dan shares so many stories in the book of of what he witnessed and who he worked with. I, what I love about how this book came together, Dan, and I want you to talk about your writing process in just a second, is the way you have so many stories, but the way we ended up sort of both not just curating, but then also organizing them into a collective whole that makes sense in terms of, I love what we, we called your book. It's your love letter to Broadway, right? So I know sometimes people put out salacious tell-alls or behind the scenes and it's all, you know, but there's no punching down. There's no throwing anybody under the bus. It's really about all this wonderful stuff you experienced in the Broadway theater with all these extraordinary artists. I know there's a lot of stories we couldn't include just for space. We couldn't afford to print an 8,000 word book or 8,000 page book, <laughs> but talk a little bit about your personal process. What inspired you to write this book in the first place? And then well, once you and I started working together, what were the key things that helped you get it to the point where we were able to publish it? Well, this book has been around, oh, about, f I, I, I retired in 2017 and I immediately, oh, like in a year started writing the book and I, I got an agent interested in it, but they were not, it, they felt that the, the play, the, the text needed the work that eventually you and I did, Jason, in making it cohesive and episodic and most important about the stars not about my life on Long Island playing football or this or that or my mother and father's trouble and their marriage. Not about that, but about the, the many stars I work with. So the book now starts out with Whoopi Goldberg about me managing that original production of Whoopi Goldberg on Broadway. So the book now starts out with my adventures as a Broadway theater manager. And you really wanted the book to be about that. That's what would interest the public. Stories about, you know, Whoopi and Alec Baldwin, Bob Fosse and McKellen, Bernadette Peters, Robert De Niro, August Wilson, my drinking buddy, <laughs> Kathleen Turner, Jessica Lange. Paul McCartney, Stephen Sondheim, Tom Stockard, David Mamet, Presidents Jerry Ford and Jimmy Carter, Hillary Clinton, Al Pacino, Richard Dreyfuss, Patti LuPone, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Daniel Craig, Manuel Lynn Miranda, Lynn Manuel Miranda, Denzel Washington. And that's just not all of them. That's some of them. Yeah. <laughs> that's some of them that were in the book. And, and that direction really gave me focus and allowed me to really move this project for forward. And I think we did it. I think 
We've written a good book. I just heard back this week from Andre Bishop, who's in the book, but he wrote me a little note about how much he loved the book. Oh, great. And, you know, we worked on the Sisters Rosenzweig together, and of course, we were in acting class way back in the late 70s. And uh, he's gone on to a career as a brilliant artistic director in New York, first at Playwrights Horizons, and for the last, I believe, 30 years at Lincoln Center. And he's retiring this year. <laughs> he's listening to me how he confided in me how that's not going to be easy for him. Because, well, you, you know, he can write his own book now, right? Tell him to write his own book. Yeah, I told him. I sent him back, write your own book, you bum. <laughs> no, he oh, was an actor. We were both actors in Win Hanman's class, who was a brilliant acting teacher at the time. Fantastic. I'll tell you one quick story about Win Hanman. He was, the phone rang just before class, and Win Hanman answered it, and it was Ted Danson. And when went, oh, Ted, I haven't heard from you in a long time. What are you doing now, Ted? And he goes, well, when I've been on this show, Cheers, that's the number one show on, on television for two and a half years. And Wynn goes, oh, that's nice. When are you going to come back to the theater? <laughs> no perspective. Oh, man. <laughs> Except or, you know me. what? Or the, the best perspective, one or the other. That's or the right. Best perspective, Lord knows. Yes. At oh, point. Dan. That uh, amazes I know, me. I, I said, Ted Danson, you don't know who he is, what right, Ted, right. former student, is doing. That's you know. Anyhow, if well, that, that's an interesting story because it really does tell you about the narrow vision yes. of people in the theater. Ask Al Pacino what's the imp most important place. He went to in his young life, and he will tell you the actor's studio. Yeah. Being a student of Lee Strasberg, that's the most important thing in his life. In in the actor's studio, with you know, sitting in class with Marilyn Monroe, you know, working with this one and that one, incredible, incredible. Paul Newman, Paul Newman, sitting in class with Paul Newman as he's trying to become a better actor. It's interesting. Yeah. People in the theater are that narrow. Yeah. That, yeah. They have that much tunnel vision, you know, yeah. at any rate. Well, great. Dan, I know we could just go for hours and hours with these stories, but everyone should just go get the book and get the stories there. We're going to do our wrap up here, which is always two pieces of advice and a spotlight for you. So let's start with advice number one. What is the worst advice? No, I'm sorry. I reversed it. What is the best advice that you have ever taken? Well, as a young actor, I was at the American Shakespeare Festival, and I was asked to dinner, to go to this dinner with seven or eight actors, and Joe Mahar, a very famous character actor, asked me to the dinner, asked me to go with him. But on the way there, I was 20 years old. On the way there, to the, I was a spear carrier in the shows. But on the way there, Joe goes to me, Dan, don't say too much at this dinner. Don't say too much. People will think you know something. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, who <laughs> yeah. was brilliant in many movies. You know, brilliant. Oh, man. Anyhow. That's a good line. That's so that's, good line. that was some good adva advice that I used in production meetings. When you're sitting there with David Laveau, who's directing the real thing, and you're sitting at the table with Mike Nichols and with a playwright called Tom Stoppard, let them do the talking. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe don't, maybe don't add, yeah. <laughs> let them do the talking. And I was there for one reason, because I'd been on the original production of The Real Thing, and Mike, who had directed it, had forgotten everything about it. Oh, wow. And David Laveau, one of, who was directing this production with Jennifer Ely and Stephen Delane, wanted to know if there was anything that was absolutely like the first production. And I went through scene by scene, and uh, the first production was with Jeremy Irons and Glenn Close. 
And I went through scene by scene and really told them that, well, no, I really don't think our production is is similar to yours scene by scene in any way. It's different. The words are the same, but the production is different. And how it's staged is totally different, which made David Laveau so happy. And Mike Nichols, he was happy because he got to leave the meeting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got to leave the meeting. And Tom didn't remember much about it either. And wow. Tom is the most wonderful man and playwright you could ever meet. He's just fabulous. There's a dirty Great. story I could tell I can't tell. <laughs> oh, no. no I'll, I'll, get, I'll get banned from Apple. <laughs> there you go. There you so, go. Now we'll flip it. So now, what is the worst advice that you have ever given? The worst advice that I was ever given? Uh, stay with Schubert. <laughs> and I worked for Schubert 37 years, but Disney came after me to run the new theater on 42nd Street which eventually, and I sat down with the vice president, Skip Malone, and his advisor, John Prof Petrofessor, who'd been the number two man to the international. And John was there to negotiate new deals with the unions that were better than the deals the League of New York Theaters and Producers had. So we sat down, I gave my advice, and I just said, I have three children, I want a contract. I have to have a contract. Right. I was afraid the head of Disney would walk in the ro room, throw me a question. I would fumble it, and he would go, who's this guy? Get him out of here. That's paranoid and ridiculous. That was a major opportunity in my life because Disney came to Broadway with the Lion King, and they sit down now, and they are a major power. Well, I would have been there at the beginning of that. Perhaps yeah. I've grown with the organization, not become Tommy Shoemaker, who runs it now, but someone who is up there in the chain of command. I worked for the same five, six guys at Schubert my whole life. When one passed away, then I had five guys ahead of me. When two passed away, <laughs> I had four. But they're still there. They're still there, as it were. So stay with Schubert at the time was probably not the best advice. I should have <laughs> gone over to Disney. And the first two things Disney did was the two things I recommended was you got to hire union treasurers to sell out a 1,700-seat theater, and you better use union stagehands or they'll, they'll form a picket line and your scenery yep. won't get through them. And yep. other teamsters driving the trucks will not cross their picket line. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the first thing Disney did. They hired union stagehands and union treasurers, and there you go. And now they're on Broadway to stay. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, major, yes. It's a major business for them. Oh, yeah. Oh, great, Dan. Thank you for— and What was the third question? Well, that, this is the third one coming up. It's a spotlight for you. Where can people learn more about you? I'll put, I'll put links to your book directly in the show notes, but what else can I put there? If people want to learn more or read your work, where, th where should they go? Well, my book, which I think is a good book called Lefty, is on Amazon. It's about a baseball player who falls into debt to the legendary Dutch Schultz, and through him, Dutch tries to fix the uh, 1932 World Series like like Abe Attell did try to fix the nine did fix the 1919 World Series. My plays are on my website, which is Daniel DanLandonWrites.com. A couple of them are. My latest play is not there yet because we're still shopping it around mm -hmm. and trying to get it done somewhere else besides the players all very happy with the production of the players. What made me happy? The audience laughed, and it's a comedy. That and boom. <laughs> we used to say on Broadway, well, if they laugh, that's great. If they don't, it's a tragedy. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> you go from a comedy to a tragedy. So that's enough. You know. Great. No, that's fantastic. I'm still writing. I'm writing a new play now. Not coming along as well. But you can relate to that, Jason. Oh, sometimes yeah. writing comes, sometimes it doesn't. Fits and starts. <laughs> Fits and starts, exactly. 
Right. Dan, thank you so much for joining me and sharing all these stories. And what a pleasure it's been to work with you on your book. Thank you so much, Jason. You are the hero of this book. Oh, you my God. <laughs> correctly. You pushed me in the right direction so that now people like Andre Bishop say, Dan, I loved it. Great. Well, you're very welcome and looking forward to the next one. <laughs> thank you. You've been listening to the Page and Stage podcast. All my thanks to this week's guest and to all of you out there for listening. If you enjoyed or found value in this podcast, please tell at least one other person. Word of mouth has always been and will always be the best marketing tool in the world. You can learn more about all my guests and access their websites and projects in the show notes. And hey, feel free to send me your thoughts, your comments, your questions at jason at pageandstage.art. I always love to hear from you, and I might just even feature your questions on future episodes. This podcast is built with Alitu, the all-in-one podcasting app created by the amazing team over at thepodcasthost.com. Thank you again for listening. And until next time, I'm Jason Cannon, and I cannot wait to hear your story.